Welcome to Transformers, the podcast about how business people and policymakers are creating a sustainable future. I'm your host, Kai Embren. In today's program, we will talking about how plants and gardens have the power to make our cities greener. AIPH, the International Association of Horticulture Producers, created the World Green City Award for worldwide cities to participate. In our podcast today, I have Miss Valérie Planté, Major of Montreal, Kobe Brand, Regional Director of ICLEI Africa, Harriet Balkeley, Professor of Geography at Durham University, United Kingdom, and Audrey Tim, Technical Advisor to ASPH, a Green City Award. Welcome uh, all to Transformers. In 2022, Montreal won the World Green City Award of Living Green for Water for the Montreal Botanical Garden, recognized as one of the world's greatest botanical gardens. Congratulations, Ms. Valerie Plante, for Montreal's win. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be here with you uh, today on, on Transformers. What does a prize mean for Montreal, Valerie? Uh, well, it's always um, great and encouraging to get recognition from from uh, networks and people that uh, really understand how crucial it is for, for everybody, including cities, to put together initiative that will contribute to uh, the ecological transition. So for us, it's been, it's been uh, great. I have to say Montreal's always been uh, very keen on innovation and uh, ecological transition is part of, I would say, the city's mandate, but also me as mayor, I, dis- I got elected on a-, a strong agenda on ecological transition. So everything needs to be put together for it to happen. So to start with words, but then it has to continue with actions. So what is your green city goals for Montreal looking at uh, 2030? Right. Well, maybe for your for your listeners, so Montreal is in the uh is in the, the second biggest uh city in in Canada. And as we all know in North America, uh I mean it's uh you know people use their cars all the time and even public transit though it's been evolving a lot it's not the same as being in Europe for example uh, so the options are, are less available so when it comes to ecological transition we need to have strong targets regarding reducing our emission when it comes to transportation but also to how do we want to decarbonize our buildings so why I'm saying this is that for Montreal to have an objective of, of carbon neutrality uh, by 2050 is a very ambition one and we want to reduce our emission by 55 percent by 2030 which is almost tomorrow morning so there is a lot to be done and areas where uh, we do have full control. When it comes to transportation, we have less control because we're working with other level of governments. So this is why an initiative like the one that we got rewarded for the uh, phytotechnology, as an example, is very important because for cities, for me, uh, we do have full control about some very strong elements, but it's a partnership. So I, I would say that Whatever we decide to invest massively in our budget for ecological transition, buy lands to do more green spaces, planting trees, uh, offering more public transport option, active transport as well. So Montreal is a, a bike of cities, a, a city of bikes, sorry, it's the opposite way. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, it's how do we want to share better the road, uh, taking some, uh, <clears throat> having more spaces for pedestrians and cyclists. So everything we can do is very important. And then we work with in, in partnership with uh, other level of governments. But again, when we get recognized on the international scene, it helps me to get the buy-in from the other level of government as well. But as a mayor, you have the power to drive change and uh, implement policy and action to make your city greener. 
We, we, which do you see as a, the key driver for change and uh, to be implemented in Montreal? Yeah, I mean, like I was saying, there's so many things cities and mayors can do. And I am very proud to be part of a network of mayors, which is a C40 as an example, where we challenge ourselves and we share best practices. Because I do believe that uh, though other bigger like states come up with laws and, and of course financial resources, but it is at the city level where we're so connected to our citizens. We have this ability to mobilize and to come up with very concrete, pragmatic solutions to the challenges we're facing when it comes to uh, e ecological transition. So, um, for example, for, for me, we decided to include in our budget money specifically for ecological transition, which is kind of horizontal. It goes across our mm. budget, and that is important. We also have a grid to now evaluate every single project through the ecological transition lens. Also, we're lucky here in Montreal because uh, there is a, we're very strong at the international level from uh, when it comes to sustainable finance. Because let's be honest, there we can have all the best goals and intention in the world, but finances needs to follow. And it's how we turn ecological behavior into an economic reflex. So working with institutions, with big funds, so we can make sure that investors go where it's sustainable in terms of investment. There's, there's so many things cities can do from a very concrete perspective. So I think this is important. Which are the main obstacles to implement um, uh, and to be uh, to let Montreal be greener? Is it any particular <laughs> issue that you see as a, a little bit of a problem? I would say I would say two. The first one is how do we want to cultivate a culture of change? <laughs> uh, you know, when you, people will all agree that we need to do more for the environment and save the planet, but of course, when you take some of the privilege whatever it's sharing the road or putting more money into buying green lands or saving spaces for, for green lands. So sometimes it gets into uh, citizens can say, wait a minute, I don't like how it, it, it impacts me personally, individually. But I always remind people that as mayor, for me, I'm about the collective benefits less than the individual benefits, right? But it's not always easy. So you need to stay strong, even though uh, the wind sometimes blows very strong. But then when you explain it and you say why and you put the passion and effort into it, people get it. The second element would be, even though we are very ambitious, unfortunately, when it comes to huge changes, how will we adapt the territory? How do we want to make bylaws? And, and But we need the resources and the buy-in from the other level of government. And sometimes that can be very frustrating because I do feel that a city like Montreal is willing and the population is so ready to go stronger, but we need to convince the government of Quebec and the federal government of Canada to also do their part and to do what is needed for us cities mm. to go stronger. Mm. Yeah, but maybe it's easy, uh, easy to help people to make uh, to put the plant in, in the soil. <laughs> Good message to mobilize people. Yeah, of course, you're and, right. Uh, I, I see some some connection also to the photosynthesis that uh, the sun and the plants uh, <laughs> can give us power, and but they need a mayor who drive the change. You're right. You're right. So this is why having again this collaboration between mayors of big cities, but also smaller cities. I'm the metropolis of. Uh, of in, here in Quebec, which is a, a big province in Canada. So I feel that my role uh, is to be a leader in coming up with projects and tools and bylaws that other cities, smaller ones, can also use. So we need to support each other uh, so we can stand strong and support our, our local population. Because again, we're at the forefront when there's a, mm. a big climate change, like there's a flaw of flooding or... or uh, uh, heat waves. It is people that comes to us to say we're suffering. We're we, we need help. So I think we we have this ability to mobilize the uh, local population as well. Now you're sitting in Montreal in Canada, and I'm in London in, in UK. And but you were here <laughs> yes. in London. What did you do some weeks ago? <laughs> 
what was the mission? Yeah, well, as uh, the vice chair of the C40 network, I wanted to uh, visit the, the chairman of the C40, uh, the Mayor, Mayor Khan, which is a, a person that I find very inspiring. We share a lot of, uh, of goals and and a similar perspective on how cities needs to play a very strong role. But I also wanted to see, for example, the uh, zero emission uh, zone uh, in London, because this is something we're working on in, in Montreal. We are creating a one low uh, emission zone in the downtown core and in the uh, kind of more historic core. But I, we also want to do one in, in the downtown area. So it was very interesting and inspiring to see how they, they did it because it's, it's getting bigger and bigger every time so we find that uh, this kind of phasing is is relevant so it really it's about again exchanging on on best practices and i'm really mm. proud that we can support each other on that front it was very nice to have uh, you with us uh, miss valerie planty mayor of montreal today in transformers and hope to see montreal in future challenges <laughs> of uh, the World Green City Award. How the World Green City Award can raise awareness and of the importance of plants and inspire actions, Audrey. We believe that the awards, the inaugural round, the 2022 round, has been highly successful in showcasing citywide vision in using plants and nature, um, in creating livable spaces, in inclusive um, interventions to make cities uh, wonderful places for people to live. Uh, even if we're going to talk a little bit more li later on on the 2024, but you can uh, already now say, is it any new categories uh, for 2024? We have shifted the categories slightly. I'm very pleased to say that we have one completely new category, and that's looking at how Living Green um, addresses urban agriculture and food systems. This is a bit about food security, but very much about how food in cities can be used in creating strategies and practices that um, generates community connections and people's awareness of nutrition where food comes from, minimizing waste. We've done a shift in the naming of some of the other categories. We've got a category that I was looking specifically at urban infrastructure and livability. And in this category, we're looking for entries mm. that promote and support nature positive lifestyles for all city residents, for, visit for visitors and for businesses. And this is through well-planned, designed and maintained built environment. We've um, modified the social cohesion category slightly because looking at social cohesion and inclusive com communities together. So all in all for the 2024 edition, we now have seven categories and we're going to be looking at some really impressive from cities in those. Is it anything else you can say that you learned from the 2022 award? We've learned a number of things in terms of giving the cities information about what we're expecting from them, from the from their entries. And so a lot of our work in this next phase is in giving cities support. We're developing some extra tools and extra um, information that will help them in in generating their entries. Um, we're also including in the 2024s one additional valuation criterion. Now for the 2022 awards, entries were evaluated against five criteria. We were looking for cities to explain their vision, how the initi in initiative is bold and includes a fresh new model. We asked them to explain the significance um, how serious is the issue, how widespread is it, who it affects and how broadly it affects the, the residents. And yeah. we looked at learning and transferability, what aspects there were for people to learn, for the information to be transferred to different sectors in the city, to different cities, to different countries. 
we looked at resilience, um, what it was about the entry that was mindful of the planet, addressed biodiversity loss, and what features they were that made it sustainable over time. For the 2024 award, we brought in an additional evaluation criterion, which is looking at measuring and reporting impact. And this is as much about tracking progress, demonstrating progress, as it is about looking at setting and achieving targets. So looking at trends of, of progress. And we think this is a really important conversation to start with cities, that they start to think about not just what they're doing now, but how far they've come and how they're going to be able to show the benefits that they have achieved. And there are a number of metrics and some fabulous programs that are happening um, in, in other, other organizations that we're going to bring in and ask cities to consider them and to, to tell us how they're addressing that. We have a series of Green City Briefings, which are one hour webinars, and they're running every month from now until October, and we showcase the winners. Um, we invite the winners to present their projects, and alongside that, we have some specialist or expert in that field to tell us about the evidence that is behind the success of a city's entry. We also have set up a global network which is connecting people involved in the green city space around the world. And we have the case studies on our website and we bring attention to that. So all of the entries have a case study, um, as well as the winners, we have people who've entered, which means that they get recognition of, for entering, not just winning. And we work with a range of partners as well um, to help with showcasing the entries. Um, and I'm sure you'll hear from um, Kobe of Italy, Cities with Nature, as to what they're doing to contribute. That seems to be a very good, uh, a lot of tools for the city to prepare themselves for 2024, I understand. But uh, thank you so, uh, for a, a moment, uh, Audrey. And uh, we're coming back and talk a little bit later on the 2024 preparation. Uh, let us talk a little bit more with uh, Kobe Brand, a member of the jury for 2022. Uh, thanks, Kai. Thanks for the opportunity. It's lovely being with you. I think it's in this regard that Audrey invited um, uh, me to be part of the jury. And we believe, obviously, that global action or local action drives global change. And a lot of what is decided and happening at global events like the UN Water Conference, where I just come from, from New York City, um, uh, through to the Climate COP, the Biodiversity COP, and all these platforms, um, all of those decisions have to find their feet down on the ground and be implemented locally. And that's, of course, where ICLI comes in, in supporting that accelerated action at the local level to meet global goals and national goals that are agreed upon. So, so ICLI work across um, across 22 uh, um, um, offices uh, around the world. In fact, I think it's now 24 offices around the world and um, uh, with a, a vast uh, a variety of large and small cities and local governments and subnational governments, uh, giving them support, um, access to financing is one big issue that we're focusing on right now because they want more of the financing to act um, and a project implementation, pro project preparation, and a variety of these things. So, of course, the work that... Um, the award uh, that um, um, the Horticultural Society provides through this partnership with, with Audrey and her team is great for ICLI because um, it is something that we bring to our cities as an opportunity to um, come and showcase to the world what they are doing because such great innovation is happening across our cities, Global North and Global South alike. Can we go into a little bit about the, the work in the jury and uh, the challenges to select six winners and one overall winner? Can you 
it gives us a view of how to be in Europe. I think you know it was it was um, yeah it, it was extremely interesting, but a lot of the hard work actually happened before it came to the jury because there were there were uh, there was a very very thorough technical screening when it came to the jury. Already we knew that we had top quality proposals in front of us, a very competitive uh, group of, of shortlisted candidates in front of us. So the choices were very, very hard to make. And um, the jury, um, we, we didn't all know each other beforehand, which I think was also a good thing because we came from very different walks of life and brought very different insights. But what I found very interesting was that there was such great consensus in the room in terms of who stood out, you know, who just met, met um, um, the objectives. Mm. Um, one of the one of the things that I found very interesting was that um, cities could choose which category they entered for. And sometimes, you know, it was... Quite, quite extraordinary to see how they would enter a project which I, for instance, would perhaps enter in another category for this category, you know, and there was good reason behind it, but it's interesting to see what they think stand out for a project um, versus what we as jury would think was the was the winning quality for a project. And that made it interesting and hard at the same time to choose the right winners per category. We had to keep our mind very focused on which category um, the cities also entered on. And I'm glad to hear, Audrey, that you are expanding those categories. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to say that there was great consensus about the overall winner from Hyderabad in India. Um, happens to be also an ICLI member. But, um, you know, it, that project just showed immense commitment to addressing their urban sustainability challenges in a, in a very, very mainstreamed way with high ambition uh, by incorporating innovative and collaborative solutions at a scale that is is often not come by. And the other winning cities in various categories were Bogota, Mexico City, Fortaleza, Montreal, um, who you also have um, the mayor with us, and Paris, um, leading cities in their own right in many aspects. And interestingly, Kai, um, I know you're very focused on, on, on putting the spotlight on climate change. And it's often the case that some of the winning cities in the biodiversity and nature space are also very active in climate, you know, so um, they could equally also be winners for a similar climate type of competition, I would think, showing leadership, true leadership in various areas, um, including also well, well-being and health water, social cohesion, and economic recovery and inclusive growth in the light of um, a COVID pandemic. Um, so, yeah, overall, there were um, uh, um, challenges to select, but we had, we were spoiled for choice. And um, I think the, the consensus was very easily reached in terms of who should be the winning cities. We would love to award all cities, of course. And, you know, for us, often it's not about the competition. It's about putting the spotlight on what is fantastic mm. and great and what can be done. How did you balance the different factors of innovation, impact, scalability and uh, community engagement? These are all extremely important factors in their own right, yet at the same time, they were key for us, jury, uh, us as jury members to be considered as a com combined set of factors in deciding on the overall winner. And of course, you know, inclusivity and rights-based approaches and people-centered approaches are coming more and more to the fore as people know that they want more livable um, cities that induce well-being and quality of life. So these factors um, and also positive, uh, um, uh, uh, not not only climate positive, but also net nature positive choices are extremely important. Um, for instance, um, innovation is vital as it highlights the city's ability to implement creative and cutting edge sustainable solutions that address various urban challenges. Cities that demonstrate innovative solutions to environmental challenges not only set an example for others to follow, but they also help to drive progress in urban sustainability. 
things. Mm -hmm. And scalability is another big factor. It plays a crucial role in the evaluation process as it ensures that the implemented solutions can be replicated and scaled up and expanded to other cities and regions. Um, Cities that have scalable green initiatives have the potential to have such a large impact globally. And community engagement, I mentioned this before, but it's an essential component as it encourages the active participation of local residents, making them own the project as well and not just see it happening around them, but making them part of that project. And we saw that so well in these initiatives. Mm -hmm. For ICTI, this is very important. And it was a delight to see that it Mm -hmm. was coming through in all the applications. A city that demonstrates innovation in its urban sustainability initiatives has really the potential to scale these solutions out and up and engage its community. And this means that such cities are ultimately better positioned to create a more sustainable future for their community. Were there any surprises or unexpected findings uh, under this period in as a jury? Well, I think the myth to such a, a, an altogether award scheme, because, um, um, you know, we're talking about plant growers, the plant growing industry of the world. Um, why would they come on board and, and support these very in-depth um, sustainability issues related to nature in cities? And um, my answer to that is why not? Because everybody tells everybody that we need unusual partnerships these days. We need to find new ways of working together, taking hands, embracing a more sustainable future and um, embracing what happens, what, what is great and put it out there to the world. So I think um, also the way that the jury was put together and the way that the technical team was put together was very innovative for us because it put also unlikely people together. And I think, you know, hats off to to Audrey and her team for taking this initiative. So that mm. that was a pleasant surprise mm. and we would be delighted to see it grow into okay. the future. For the so, jury, I think the other surprise was just that we were so much on the same page coming from different worlds. Any advice to your ICLEI members in front of the 2024 award? Please enter. That would be my advice. And this is also what we're going to encourage all ICLEI and, in fact, all other um, um, uh, cities around the world, whether they're members of ICLEI or not. Um, We have another initiative that we're part of called Cities with Nature. And that is ICLEI is one of about 20 partners, global partners in the world, running Cities with Nature. And um, there it's also some unusual partners. And Audrey and her team is there as well. Harriet works with us in that space as well from a technical perspective and you know i think it's just about celebrating the need to bring nature back into cities to to really um um, value nature for what it is for what it brings to cities and their communities um to life in cities but also to quality of life and health and well-being so i would the advice to our cities is please enter it's an opportunity not only to win and it's not about the winners only it's about it's about being part of this community and it's about showcasing what you are doing so well so that others can learn from you, leapfrog, duplicate and speed up action that is so urgently needed. Let's go into the technical panel and uh, Harriet Buckley, a member of the technical panel, is with us. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work and, and your role on the technical panel? Over the last few years, I've really started to focus on this idea that we can work with nature in cities to help the climate emergency, to help the climate response. And this is how I became involved in this technical panel, because I led a large uh, European project called Naturevation, which uh, developed a lot of technical knowledge about how nature-based interventions or nature-based solutions are supporting cities in addressing climate change alongside other sustainable development goals. And so on the panel, um, we we divided the work uh, of looking at all of the amazing applications that came in 
um, in, in a broad way. So we, we took applications that may have uh, identified for me climate change as that kind of core first issue, but of course they always were meeting other goals as well. So we needed to have experts on the panel that had that kind of technical breadth that could work across different issue areas and that could you know relate to one another um, where they saw the strengths and weaknesses as well. So very diverse coming from different backgrounds, but also like Kobe said, able to find consensus across that difference. Uh, so yeah, my work was really to kind of focus then on the climate change uh, category and to think about what was making those particular applications that put climate change as the first issue they were addressing to the top of that very rich pile that we were looking at. So uh, how, how, how could can the municipality prepare itself uh, to meet the technical expectation of the panel? Well, I think, um, you know, in, it, with my other hat on in, in the university here, I support a lot of my colleagues in thinking about research projects and research applications. And, and I think in a way the same is true that you really need to understand the ethos of this scheme. I mean, this is a scheme which is really about the power of plants and those schemes which really focused on the idea of, of plants and biodiversity and nature and its core to their strategies were the ones which really kind of shone through in this particular scheme. Um, so, so really grasping that idea that we're interested in the power of plants, that was the first thing. And then I think um, really moving beyond the idea that plants can provide a kind of aesthetic benefit to cities, of course they can, and that's a very long-standing tradition. You know, we have all these beautiful city campaigns and I love a beautiful city, but here we were really thinking about plants as having this power for transformation, right? So what is it that working with plants and working with greening the city can do that is transformative? And really then I think you have to start from somewhere. I mean, it's always difficult when, you know, the initiatives that you're taking are benefiting so many different goals. But those which kind of started from somewhere and said, okay, well, our first focus is water, but we also know it has these other benefits that had a nice story to tell about how one intervention was, you know, starting with a core strategy, but was also able to benefit multiple other ends. That was a, that was then easy for us to kind of see that clear focus on that one target, but also then its wider uh, benefits across the city. So understanding the ethos, thinking about the transformative potential of plants and then really focusing on that core goal, the way you want to portray your case um, and then what evidence mm. you gather around that. I would say that would that would be my advice. Mm. Corby also was into the, the balance and the, when you make yeah. your your evaluations and, and how you balance different factors in uh, innovation, impact, scalability, community engagement. How, how is it for the technical panel to look into this? Well, in a sense, I think we might have it slightly easier than Kobe in the judging panel because we had really, you know, very detailed guidance created by Audrey and the team uh, about how we should do the scoring across those different criteria. And we had some initial conversations to make sure we were all on the right page with the way which we should apply the criteria. But I think we did so pretty consistently, um, you know, given that we're a diverse group of people on this technical panel. And so our first job was then to, to use this very detailed, predefined set of questions and scoring. And then at that point, when we had all the scoring done, then we debated that kind of finer points of how do you balance across the different criteria to come to a holistic approach. So mm -hmm. we had that kind of rigor underneath it. And then we handed over the very difficult challenge of judging these things as whole things against one another to the judging panel when our technical work was done. Did you have any surprises or unexpected uh, findings under the evaluation process? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, apart from also sharing Kobe's idea that, you know, it's not every industry that decides that it wants to support cities in their quest for sustainability. So, you know, very many kudos to Audrey and the team for doing so. But I, I think, well, two real surprises. I think my first surprise was to find out that the things that we say in theory actually happen in practice. But that's always a surprise for an academic. But uh, one, one of the things that we like to say often and, and that we know from pilot studies is true, is that nature, working with nature in cities can provide multiple benefits. But here was example after example after example of that happening in practice. 
and you just always do get a bit surprised when you've been working on small scale things and the theory of how something should work to see that it's true. Uh, so that was a nice surprise as well. Um, mm. And then I think maybe the other thing was I was um, genuine, you know, like another sort of genuine level of, of surprise for me was the way in which for those cities that really were, I think, at the top of their game, the way this is embedded into a new kind of economy. So this isn't just an add on. It's not just individual projects. But it's a way of thinking about the economy as a kind of circular economy around nature as being part of that urban economy. And that was both locally as kind of local circular economies around the creation, protection and supply of plant materials for the city. Um, but also in terms of thinking about the resilience of the supply chains, the resilience of the pro processes and the policies that were being put in place over time. So you could really see in some cases that this idea of a nature positive economy was becoming much more embedded than I thought we would find it yet at this stage. Um, so that was mm. a really positive surprise. Mm -hmm. Anything about the uh, lesson learned uh, from 2022 uh, when we go into 2024? Yeah, I mean, I, I think come forward as, as Kobe said, I mean, much more going on on the ground that fits into this you know, kind of model of how cities are working with nature than you might think from the, from the outside. Uh, we made a very successful atlas, we call it, of urban nature projects across the world in the Naturevation project, which really revealed that cities are doing so many things with nature from the spectacular to the mundane, but they all add up to really matter. And even the things that you might think of as mundane and ordinary, and you've been doing them for ages, actually for another city could be really important learning really important to share so even if you think what you're doing is not spectacular and even if you're not one of the biggest cities doing one of the biggest things that doesn't mean that you don't count and that what you're doing doesn't matter so i would say come forward whatever scale of action you're taking and i think the other thing i would say would be yeah just really really focus on what you that that transformative element that what do you think that working in nature is really giving your city that not working with nature you know, if, if you mm. weren't working with nature, you're making a diff you're making a difference that you couldn't achieve without it. And I think really focusing on that element in your application would be really special. When we look at uh, 2024 World Green City Award, what is the goal? What we're doing now is expanding our um, partnerships. We're very pleased to have the wonderful range of very supportive partners from the 2022 awards continuing to support AIPH in the 2024 World Green City Awards. And we're looking at getting additional partners, looking at bringing in partners in the built environment and in urban agriculture so we can bring in cities that are doing good work in those in those categories and with both of the entries and if they win um, showcase the work that we're doing so i think that's really what we're doing leading up to it um i just would also like to add that i am both humbled and inspired by the words of both Kobe and Harriet here my colleagues who have put in so much work to help make the awards a success uh, we do rely very much on the uh, the leaders, the innovators, the experts in the field to make the awards a success. These are awards that are being run every two years. So we've got the 2024 awards open for entries now and the winners will be announced in 2024. And then we'll start in the 2026 awards. And again, we'll be looking at how we can um, adapt, improve, modify the next round after that. So how can a city prepare themselves in front of the 2024 award? Start early. I'd also oh. echo Harriet's words about really embrace the ethos of this. AIPH is the world champion for the power of plants. We know what plants can do and in opening the awards we are bringing the attention to the world to how plants can make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. So certainly start early. The awards entries, it's an online process and they're designed to be reasonably straightforward. 
but they do require some thought, partly to consider quite what in each of the different criteria is being asked, but also to condense it down to a very succinct message that will attract the attention firstly of the technical panel and then of the jury. It will require teamwork of the city. It's unlikely that any of the entries that were received were put together by one member. It is very much a team who puts us together, which again is really recognition of how much collaborative work there is and how many people are proud of the work that they're doing in their cities. So, uh, where can uh, we find more information about the uh, Ward 2024? Everything that you need to know is on the AIPH website. If you look at the Green City program, the information is there. We have got the rules and procedures there. We've got a step-by-step -step guide to helping. And if you register a profile, you can then get access to um, um, the online questions and start preparing your entry. Mm. So when is the deadline for 2024? Deadline is the 15th of September. Entries are open for six months. We believe this is sufficient time for cities to get their entry together. It also gives us time to get the word out broader um, to cities around the world using our, our network partners um, and get more cities to enter. So it's a six-month process. Entries close 15th of September. Oh, great. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to l learn more about urban farming, allotment, urban gardens, trees planting, soil quality, flooding, uh, adaptation budget. Uh, it's a lot of different types of questions that I think we, we're going to see in, in, in the, from the cities who are taking part of the next award, World Green City Award from AIPH. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for... Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>